Hey Heather, so seven questions for a starter. Should be quick and easy. Um, I want you to pause the video, attempt the questions, and then I'll go over the answers just now. Okay, so question one, what structure makes up all terpenes? You should know that is your isoprene units. Okay, two or more isoprene units, uh, units make up a, a terpene. Now this one here, draw the alcohol that can be oxi uh, that can oxidize to form compound A. So draw the alcohol. Now remember what I said, forget about the rest of the molecule, focus solely on the functional group. So it's a carbonyl group in between two carbons, so it's a ketone. So we need to draw a secondary alcohol. Now remember, the molecule, the rest of the molecule never changes, it stays the same. Okay, so you are looking at something like this. Okay, just make sure everything is perfect. Yeah, so the rest of the molecule stays the same. The only thing that's changing is that we need to draw the, the hydroxyl group. Now remember, okay, carbon's got a valence of four. A lot of people forget the hydrogen. Okay, and that's it. Okay, S solely focus on the functional group. Right, question three, C55H88. How many isoprene units can make up this molecule? So one isoprene unit has five carbons, so 55 divided by five, there are 11 isoprene units. Question four, what form of energy is used to uh, create a free radical? That is UV light energy. Yeah, very important that you know that. Uh, name the step in the above reaction. So you need to look at it. Notice that we've got a free radical creating another free radical. So this is a propagation, a propagation step. Okay. Step six, complete. So we've got a, a HI molecule, hydrogen iodide, and we're uh, putting UV into the obviously the, the bond so we're going to break that and because we've used UV light we're going to create free radicals okay we're going to create a hydrogen free radical and an I free radical okay now the question never asked for it but this is an activation step because we're creating free radicals okay and in this step we've got two free radicals coming together so nice and easy this is a, a CH3Cl molecule we're creating, and of course, this is a termination step. Okay, termination. And uh, question seven: Why are free radical scavengers added to skincare products? Um, as they react with free radicals to form stable molecules which stops the chain reaction. Okay? Stops the chain reaction. And that's what free radicals scavengers are doing. Yeah, they're reacting with free radicals, they form stable molecules, and that way no further damage can be done to the skin. Or at least it helps. Okay, so hopefully you got on okay with that. Now, the lesson we're going to move on to, which is the last, the last bit in unit two, and we'll have completed pretty much all of unit two. In fact, we will have completed all of unit two. And so I want you to get ahead in chemistry of cooking, lesson one. Now, we're going to look at this lesson, flavour in food. Okay, very important, obviously, any sort of bit of cooking you do, it's all chemistry related, it can all be explained through chemistry. Okay, so let's start off. So first of all, uh, you need to know, many flavour, many flavours in food are due to volatile molecules. Okay, they're due to volatile molecules and hopefully 
Uh, you should know that volatile means they are easily evaporated. Okay, that's what volatile means, but we've explained that before. They contain volatile molecules. Okay, easily evaporated. So, just to give you a sort of background of what happens here, you, you wouldn't really uh, sort of be asked this, but it's, it's nice to know. So, what happens, so during cooking, the cell walls, okay, the cell walls of the food, they break, Okay, so the cell walls of the food break by moisture within the cell and release these volatile flavour molecules. Okay? That's what happens. When we start cooking, these flavour molecules, they get released. Now what happens now? Okay, you don't really need to know about the cell walls part, but certainly about the whole flavour molecules releasing. So our nose picks up these smells and it adds to the flavour, okay? Smell is such an important part of cooking. Um, a lot of the taste is in the smell. And what I mean by that, <clears throat> you can't actually taste a lot of, <coughs> sorry, you can't actually taste a lot of foods without being able to smell them. And I can actually prove it if you've got a packet of, say, cheese and onion crisps, if you hold your nose, you can't tell what flavour of crisp you're tasting because you, you you can't taste the cheese and onion. Now, that works for quite a lot of crisps, like you've got cheese and onion, prawn cocktail, um, smoky bacon, so on. Um, doesn't work for uh, sort of salt and vinegar because your tongue picks up like the salt and vinegar of it, so you can't really work it for that. But yeah, a lot of the taste is in the smell. Okay, so, for example, you can't taste cheese and onion crisps with your nose held, okay? And that, unfortunately, uh, we, we normally do that in class and we get crisps in and we get all different types of food in, but unfortunately we, we can't really do that. Um, so let's carry on. Now, what you need to know yeah, flavour molecules, there's two types of flavour molecules. They can either, can either be water soluble, okay, and if they are water soluble, that means it, they are polar, yeah, because water is polar and polar dissolves polar. So the flavour molecules can either be polar, water soluble, or fat slash oil soluble. And if they are fat slash oil soluble, that makes them non-polar, okay? But to be honest, you, you already knew the difference between water soluble and fat oil soluble. Now, we're gonna look at different cooking methods, okay? Now, we do look in this into a lot more detail when we start looking at steaks and eggs and stuff like that, but I'm just going to make it simple just now, and then next week we'll come on to talking about the, the steaks and the, the eggs. But what we're going to look at, we're going to look at why we cook certain foods in water and why we cook certain foods in oil or fat, butter. So, the question, the big question is why do we... You might not even know that we do this, but why do we cook green beans and broccoli in water and cook 
asparagus in oil. Okay, that's what that's what you should be doing. Yeah, you should be cooking your green beans and broccoli in water and your asparagus in oil. Now the reason, and it is actually pretty cool, and it's all explained by chemistry, and it all makes perfect sense, is that green beans, okay, green beans and broccoli, uh, two C's, I always forget how to spell broccoli, green beans and broccoli contain non-polar, okay, and because they're non-polar, that makes them fat and oil soluble, okay, so green beans and broccoli contain non-polar flavour molecules, okay, they contain non-polar flavour molecules and are cooked in polar water, okay, I'll put that in brackets because water of course is always polar, um, so yeah, now the reason that we do that, if we cook green beans and broccoli in oil, the oil will dissolve the flavour molecules and if they dissolve the flavour molecules, we'll lose the flavour molecules, okay, so that's why we have to cook it in the opposite, so, uh, and are cooked in flavour, uh, and, and cooked in polar water, so that the flavour molecules do not dissolve in the water. Okay, it's very important. We want to keep, we want to retain the flavour molecules in the green beans and broccoli. So, like I said, if we cooked that in oil, the oil would dissolve the flavour molecules into the oil and we would lose it. Yeah, and that's what we would do in, uh, down in home ec. We would cook green beans and broccoli in water and we would cook green beans and broccoli in oil and there is a vast difference. Yeah, the ones cooked in water taste nice. The, one, the ones cooked in oil, they just taste bland, okay? So they, they, do, they do not dissolve in the water. Now remember, just a wee sort of side note, that polar molecules... do not, yeah, polar molecules do not dissolve non-polar molecules. And that's the reason, okay? Now, obviously we need to look at the asparagus, but asparagus is pretty much identical, but just the exact opposite. Now, what happens is the asparagus contains polar, okay, so water soluble flavour molecules. And is cooked in non-polar fat slash oil. So that the flavour molecules so that the flavour molecules are retained okay so they are retained and do not dissolve in the oil Okay, and I think that makes absolutely perfect sense, okay? So asparagus contains polar flavour molecules, okay? So we cook it in the opposite, we cook it in non-polar fat and oil, and that way the fat and oil doesn't dissolve the flavour molecules. The flavour molecules are retained in the asparagus, they taste lovely, and yeah, that's it. So that's why, that's why we do different, there's a reason why well, there's a reason for everything why we cook uh, foods a certain way, but obviously that's just us breaking into it. But yeah, that's it. Right. So, as I sort of mentioned before, volatile molecules 
are responsible for flavors. Okay, and what basically what we mean by that um, is the more volatile the flavor molecule is. Okay, so volatile molecules are responsible for flavor. So more volatile the flavor molecule, the more flavor you're going to get. Okay, so the easier it is to evaporate, obviously the easier we're going to be able to smell it. So, and that's going to add to the flavor. Okay, so the more volatile a uh, flavor molecule is, the more flavor you're going to get from that. Now, there are two factors that affect this. Okay, so two factors affect how volatile a molecule is. Okay. And we'll look at each one. Obviously, it's the chemistry of it. So we are going to look at the size of the flavor molecule. So what we mean by that, we've got similar, similar structures. Okay. Um, similar structures, different sizes. So what we mean by that, you could have, say, two alcohols, just two alcohols of different sizes. You could have two alkanes but different sizes, um, two alkenes, but of different sizes. Okay, so the, what we're going to look at, you know, I mean, you could do this for anything, but we're going to look at CH4 and C5H12. Okay, so they're both alkenes, yeah, but one's bigger than the other. Obviously, the C5H12 is bigger. So this is what we're going to look at. Just sort of highlight that. So let's start with the smaller one, okay? Let's look at the smaller molecular size, okay? So we're going to look at the CH4. Now, this, you already know this. Yeah, I'm not going to teach you anything here. I'm just bringing it together. I'm linking it to flavor volatile molecules, volatile flavor molecules. So if we've got a smaller molecular size, that means we've got weaker or less, I suppose, weaker LDFs between the molecules. Okay? Of course. Yeah, if we've got a smaller size, we're going to have less LDFs. They're going to be weaker. So if they are weaker, that means less energy is required to break, yeah, to break them. And if less energy is required to break them, that means that they're going to be more volatile. Yeah, they're going to evaporate easier. If there's less LDFs holding them together, yeah, they're going to evaporate easier. So if they're more volatile, that means that we're going to, there's going to be more flavour to them. Okay, and that's it. So simple. You already knew that. We're just linking it to flavor molecules now, okay? Now, again, if we focus on the, the larger molecular size, okay, so the, the C5H12, the pentane, okay, if that's bigger, that means they're going to have stronger or more LDFs between the molecules, yeah? If we've got more LDS between the molecules, that means we need more energy, yeah? They're harder to break, more energy needed to break, yeah? They're gonna be much harder to break. So if they are much harder to break, that means they're gonna be less volatile, okay? And if they're less volatile, that means they don't evaporate as much. They aren't going to go, oh, sorry, into our nose as easy. So we're going to have less flavour to them. Okay? And that's it. Honestly, that's it. Now, the next one. 
The next sort of factor that can affect how volatile a molecule is, and again, this is something that you already know, it's functional groups. Okay, and the, the functional groups we're going to focus on are the hydroxyl, the amine group, yeah, NH2, and the carboxyl group. Yeah, that's it. Now, when we are focusing on the functional groups, yeah, uh, they need to have similar mass. So similar mass when comparing. Okay, so example would be, um, let's go for methanol. Okay, so that has got a mass of, if you did, if you worked at the GFM, yeah, the mass of one mole would be 32 grams. Yeah, 12, add 4, add 16, 32. Um, need to have, oh, sorry, you need to have similar mass. Similar mass when comparing. So methanol is 32 grams. We could compare that with oh, ethane, I think. Yeah, should be. So we could compare that with C2H6, 24, would be 30 grams. Okay, so 32, 30 grams. And again, we've already spoke about this in a previous uh, topic. Um, you need to have similar gra uh, masses when you're comparing. So one's got a functional group, one doesn't have a functional group. Okay, so and the reason why I have to have a similar mass is so that they've got the same number of electrons and of course that means they've got a similar strength of LDFs, okay? Because we aren't interested in the LDFs. If we've got a functional group, yeah, like hydroxyl, the amine group, or the carboxyl group, we're focusing on the hydrogen bonding, okay? So we don't want the LDFs to come into play. We just solely want to focus on hydrogen bonding or no hydrogen bonding, okay? So, let's add this wee note. Um, all three functional groups, so all three functional groups exhibit hydrogen bonding. Okay, and of course everyone's got hydrogen bonding because you've got a hydrogen covalently bonded to an N, O or F, remember. Okay, so all three functional groups is a bit hydrogen bonding, so that is H covalently bonded to N, O or F. Okay, so they exhibit hydrogen bonding between their molecules, yeah? Remember, just a wee sort of refresher from uh, unit one, the hydrogen bonding isn't between the O and the H, it's between the H and the O of another molecule, it's between the O and the H of another molecule, okay? Remember that. So, let's look at the, the two sort of uh, differences. So, we'll look at the molecule with no functional groups. So in this case, that would be your C2H6, yeah, your ethane, 30 grams. So contain only LDFs, yeah, because obviously the electronegativity difference is 0 0.3, so it's less than 0 0.5, so it contains only LDFs. Now, just make a wee note or may contain permanent dipole, PD, PD interaction. It may contain PD, PD inter... Put an M there for some reason. May contain PD, PD interactions. Okay. 
Um, that could be like your aldehydes and ketones. Yeah, the carbonyl group, the C double bond O. Yeah, it doesn't contain hydrogen bonding, obviously, because there's no H covalently bonded to N or F, but it would contain permanent dipole, permanent dipole interactions. And a lot of aldehydes and ketones do have a lot of flavours to them. Okay, so a lot of food, uh, a lot of food actually contains aldehydes and ketones. Okay, so contain only LDFs. Now, if they do contain only LDFs, or maybe just some PD PD interactions, you obviously are going to there's going to be less energy um, needed to break the molecules. Okay, and if we've got less energy. Uh, needed, that means they're going to be more volatile, so we're going to have more flavour to them. Okay, and that's it. Okay, that is it. Now, if we have, if we have, oh, my pen's running out, let's carry on with the pink one. So, if we have functional groups present. Okay, just like, um, for example, methanol, CH3OH, then what that means, they will contain, they will contain LDFs, obviously, but the exact same, a similar strength to the, the ones with no functional groups, so they will contain LDFs, however, they are going to contain, because it contains that hydroxyl group, it's going to contain hydrogen bonding as well, okay? So hydrogen bonding, you've got less energy. Eh, oh, sorry, not less energy, that's my fault. You're gonna need more energy needed to break, yeah? And if we've got more energy needed uh, to break the molecule, then they're gonna be less volatile, they aren't gonna evaporate as easily, okay? And if they're less volatile, that means we're going to have less flavour to them. Okay, and that's it. Yeah, that is it. So, I'm going to stop there. I'm just going to recap what we've done. So, we're looking at flavour in food, okay? And it's all to do with the volatile flavour molecules, okay? How easily they evaporate. Okay, because as you, as you know, a lot of the the taste is in the smell. Okay, flavour molecules can either be water soluble or non-polar fat soluble. Okay, you need to know why we cook green beans and broccoli in water, why we cook asparagus in oil. Okay, and it's all to do with the flavour molecules. The the green beans and broccoli. Um, they contain non-polar flavour molecules, so we cook it in water so that the water doesn't dissolve the flavour molecules, yet retains the flavour molecules within the greens, uh, green beans and the broccoli. And the asparagus, exactly the same, just the opposite. Yeah, We cook it uh, because it contains polar flavour molecules, so we cook it in non-polar fat and oil so that flavour molecules don't dissolve, they're retained in the asparagus. Yeah, and then we start to move on and look at the, the reason behind why some molecules are volatile, why some molecules are less volatile. And there's two sort of factors to that. I should have highlighted the second one. You can either have the size, okay, so similar structures, just different sizes, and it's all to do with the amount of LDFs. Yeah, smaller the size, less LDFs, less energy needed to break, easier to break, that makes them more volatile. Yeah, so we're going to get more flavour. And the opposite for the larger one. Now the other one is we could have functional groups present, the hydroxyl group, the amine group, the carboxyl group. Okay, and remember when we're comparing, they need to have a similar mass because they've got the same number of electrons, which means they've got a similar strength in LDF. So the only thing we're comparing is the difference between hydrogen bonding and no hydrogen bonding, okay? Now, obviously, if we've got hydrogen bonding present, yeah, more energy is going to be required to break these molecules, so that's going to make them less volatile, so we're going to get less flavour, yeah? And you need to know all of that, okay? So I'm going to put up some questions on Teams for us to do. 
and that will be us. So thank you.